Welcome everyone to our latest service on the church website, on YouTube and on CD as well for some. I hope and pray that you are uh, knowing something of God's presence and blessing through these days of adversity. Uh, we are a nation that has indeed known adversity before. And on this weekend, in particular, when we are celebrating the 75th anniversary of VE Day, I've been reflecting a little bit on God's faithfulness. Psalm 117 speaks of this. It's the shortest psalm, but a psalm with a tremendous message of encouragement and assurance. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples, for great is his love towards us. The faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. So on this uh, weekend of remembering and thanksgiving, let us draw near to God in prayer. Our God and Father, we praise you for your great faithfulness towards us, uh, that faithfulness that is seen and known by us as individuals, as uh, a church, and as a nation. Lord, on this weekend of remembrance, we are mindful of great deliverances of the past, when you held back the advance of evil and the cause of freedom and peace prevailed. So we honor and give thanks, Lord, for the many who gave there today for our tomorrow, and we renew our prayer for and commitment to peace. Lord, we ask that you would be with our military veterans in these times, grant healing of body and mind and spirit where that is needed. Uh, Lord, watch over our armed forces today. May they know your, your blessing and your protection. May the church's chaplains be effective in holding out the hope of the gospel. Bless the work of Sazra, Lord, we pray, in all of their work to promote your word in our services. Lord, your faithfulness is uh, also known and experienced in your church. And so your faithfulness to, the, to your church is also the theme of our praise. We thank you for the way that you have sustained your church, both globally and locally, all through the centuries of her existence. Your church, O oh Lord, often uh, because of your people in error, uh, often divided, Lord, often persecuted by the world, and yet, O oh Lord, the possessor of that great promise of yours, that the gates of hell shall never, never prevail against her, because you, O oh Lord, are in her midst. So renew our commitment to your church, O oh Lord, even in these days of restriction, in these days when there is no uh, public gathering for worship. Nevertheless, O oh Lord, renew our commitment to your church. And Lord, your faithfulness to each and every one of us is a matter for unending praise. All through our lives, O oh Lord, you are with us, you are for us, and by your Spirit you are in us. Despite our failings and our sins, you are patient with us, O oh Lord, and we have your many and precious promises to sustain us and encourage us. Lord, we do confess our sins before you today, our sins of thought and word and deed, the many ways in which our deeds all too often contradict our profession of faith. Forgive, cleanse, and renew us, O Lord, as we remember these gracious promises of your forgiveness for your people, as we depend upon them, O Lord. And <clears throat> Father, we, we thank you, uh, as we thank you for your faithfulness to our nation, we do confess that as a nation we have squandered the spiritual legacy of previous generations. Your word, O oh God, declares, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And yet we have turned away from God and godliness as a nation. We have scorned righteousness and exalted wickedness. We have squandered the sacrifice of so many from previous generations. We have forgotten the God who surely delivered us in the past. Have mercy, O oh Lord, in these days of disease and lockdown, and Lord, in the future days of economic adversity that are surely coming, turn the hearts and minds of our nation once again to you. We have forgotten you, forgotten the gracious hand that preserved us and strengthened us and enriched us. We have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace. 
We've become too proud to pray to the God who made us. Have mercy, O Lord. Turn us back to you, we pray. And in a moment, Lord, as we open up your word together, then we ask, open our hearts to receive the instruction of your word that we might indeed become more the people that you would have for us to be, that we might become more like your Son, the Lord Jesus himself. So draw near to us, we pray, wherever we are, uh, however we're engaging with this service, O oh Lord, draw near, uh, uh, be near to us, be within, remind us of your presence and of your love. Uh, draw near, especially to those who are struggling with problems of isolation, with the, the stress of loneliness, uh, and with ill health, O oh Lord. Help us to pour out all of our needs before you, thanking you, O oh Lord, that you know us, that you love us, and that you are the, the faithful God who never yet abandoned his children. And so, all of our thanks and praise we bring through Jesus Christ our Lord, and in his name. Amen. Now we are continuing, um, as we have been for a few weeks, on the shorter catechism to uh, think about the teaching of the, the confessional standards of our church, and it's good and healthy for us to, to go through these things from time to time. So we've come to question 11 today, question 11, which asks, what are God's works of providence? What are God's works of providence? And the answer supplied in the, in the catechism is this. God's works of providence are his most holy, wise, and powerful preserving and governing all his creatures and all their actions. His most holy, wise, and powerful preserving and governing all his creatures and all their actions actions. Thus are the, uh, the, the works of God's providence and the catechism there teaching that not just the universe but our own individual lives are preserved and directed and governed by God. And all in such a way, of course, as does not rob us of true freedom to make decisions and since freedom brings with it responsibility, also in such a way as does not uh, clear us of uh, accountability for those decisions. Some key words to draw out from the uh, answer there of the 11th question. Holy. God's providence is said to be holy. God works out everything in accordance with his holy, just, and righteous, and perfect will. Uh, he, all that he does is good, uh, not just in creation, because we know that God created and it was good, but all that God does in providence is good as well. That is the absolute insistence of the, of the confession and, more importantly, of the Bible. So, God's providence is holy. We also see that God's providence is wise. So, in perfect wisdom, and that is informed by God's omniscience, by his complete knowledge of all things. And so in this way, God is wise and preserves and governs all things. Now, of course, we are not all wise and we are not all knowing. And so, therefore, it follows that we are not ever going to fully understand and grasp all the ways in which God works, all the ways in which he governs and preserves our lives and the universe, because we don't see the full picture in the way that God does. Uh, only God is perfect in wisdom. And so, faith, which we are always required to have, because without faith it is impossible to please God, faith uh, must trust that God knows better, perhaps a little bit like in the way that a young child sometimes just has to submit to the will of a parent. Uh, because as the child begins to learn, it would be nice to think that they might begin to learn that the parent knows more, that the parent knows best. And in a similar way, we need to learn as believers to submit and to trust in what God is doing. So, so God's providence is holy, and God's providence is wise. And the third thing there is that God's providence is said to be powerful. In divine power, we are assured that God is more than able to accomplish all that he sets out to do. That's a word of reassurance. He has the power to preserve and govern not just us, not just us, uh, in, the, in the relative smallness of our own individual existence, but also the, the entirety of the universe and all of its uh, vastness on the one hand and all the minutiae of, uh, of, of its detail on the other. 
So we can certainly rest secure in the assurance uh, that we get from divine providence. The, the kind of assurance that's seen in this little uh, snippet from a, 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 a church elder, an old church elder who was once asked how he was keeping. And he replied, I'm no keeping, I'm kept. And that's a great answer, isn't it? I'm no keeping, I'm kept. Uh, and that's the assurance and joy of knowing that saints by the power of God are kept till the salvation come. And so we thank God again for the teaching of the catechism. And uh, let's take that to heart as a word of assurance for these days, because uh, these are perhaps days when it's difficult to uh, see. It can be frustrating to feel the reality around us of restriction, lockdown, uh, and people sometimes getting a bit fed up of just looking around the four walls of their home. But Nevertheless, we do trust that God, with full knowledge, with total power, with holiness in all of his ways, God certainly knows what he is doing uh, and will continue to do all that he does for the glory of his name, for the building of his church. Uh, and so that is good enough for me. I hope it's good enough for you as well. Now, on the intimations front, I don't have too much to say today. In fact, I don't really have anything to say today because everything that you, you do need to know is on the weekly uh, update that uh, comes out on Tuesdays. And for those who, who get the CDs posted out, I know that it's a wee bit late by the time you get there. It's pr probably about a week late, but it keeps you in the picture and keeps you up to date as well. And God willing, service next weekend will be online and on CD, as has now become the usual. And it seems like lockdown is continuing for a bit longer, certainly through May. Uh, and I think we'll be uh, for quite a few weeks yet on the, the present basis that we're operating on. But that's all for further down the line. For, for now, we are going to turn once more in the Word of God to uh, the New Testament and to the letter of James. Uh, James chapter 5 is where we have got to, and so it is to there that we now turn. James 5, and reading uh, today verses 1 to 6. As we continue our studies here in this, this tremendously practical and helpful New Testament letter, last time we were thinking very clearly about the subject of submission, submission specifically to God. And that really is the theme that ran through the whole of chapter 4, uh, submitting to God's law is what we thought about last time, particularly in the relation to um, our treatment of others and our use of the tongue. And I, I know that many of you, from speaking to you through this week, uh, felt that a very uh, challenging word of application, as I did myself uh, in, in all of that. And then also submitting to God's will, not being presumptuous about what we will do tomorrow or the next day or the next year, but, but trusting rather in God and acknowledging our own limitations, that we are just a vapor, a mist. We're here today and gone tomorrow, uh, and recognizing that we, we can, we should, we must trust in the Lord rather than presumptuously trust in ourselves and our own plans. So, Today we're going to be thinking very much about our attitudes towards wealth and riches. That's what we find in James 5, uh, where we start reading at verse 1. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered innocent men who were not opposing you. Amen. And we thank God for his word to us today. So we're in James 5, 1 to 6, and my title for this message is How to Be Really Rich. How to Be Really Rich. In the, by way of introduction, in the 1987 film Wall Street, the character Gordon Gecko, who is played by Michael Douglas, is an unscrupulous businessman and the largest shareholder in the company Teldar Paper. 
and he is invited to address the shareholders' meeting. And as he nears the end of his speech, he says uh, in, in this memorable uh, speech, the point is, ladies and gentlemen, that greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. Greed clarifies, cuts through, and captures the essence of the evolutionary spirit. Greed in all of its forms, greed for life, for money, for love, knowledge, has marked the upward surge of mankind. And greed, you mark my words, will not only save, save Teldar paper, but that other malfunctioning corporation called the United States of America. It was an American film, of course. Now, for the avoidance of any doubt, I am not, in fact, quoting that speech with approval. But it sets the scene for the message that James conveys to us here in chapter 5, at the beginning of the final chapter of this letter. And so my title today, How to Be Really Rich. I wonder if you consider yourself to be rich. I wonder how you go about calculating your own personal wealth. The Bible has things to say about that. In the preceding section, in verse 13, James referred to businessmen who presumptuously say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. He showed that such a presumptuous attitude is unwise, since there is so much that is outside our control. Wisdom, rather, is to submit to God's will and to acknowledge our own dependence upon God. And maybe it was the thought of these presumptuous businessmen going about their lives without a thought of the God whose blessings they enjoy and whose favor they presume. Maybe it was that thought that sparked the next sequence of thought in the letter as James addresses you rich people concerning their wealth. So who are these rich people who are in James's sights just now? Well, it's difficult to say for certain because James writes in verse 1 of misery that is coming upon them, and he doesn't seem to hold out much hope of repentance. And because of that, some scholars take this to be a word to, to worldly people, unbelievers, those outside the church. But that would be strange since this is a letter to Christians. You remember in chapter 1, verse 1, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. And it's difficult, really, to see how uh, unbelievers would get to hear this message unless they were, they were among the, the, the church. So I think this is really one of these times when it's a both-and rather than either-or situation. If unbelievers hear this, that will be good. They will be uh, benefiting by being well-warned about the worldly attitudes they have towards wealth. And for believers, well, we have to acknowledge that we are always battling against the worldliness that seeks entry into our lives. And so we do well to consider our own attitude towards wealth and to ensure that we have a godly and not a worldly view of it. Now, let me just make one final introductory point before we really get into it, and it is this. The Bible does not have a negative attitude towards money, contrary to what is often thought. Indeed, one of the most misquoted verses in the whole of the Bible, I think, must be 1 Timothy 6, verse 10, which is often taken to say, money is the root of all evil, but which actually does say that the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. So, biblically speaking, money is, is a neutral thing. It's the same with wealth, property ownership, possessions. All these things are neutral. Those who possess them can use them for good, for the blessing of others, for the building of God's kingdom, or they can use them selfishly and succumb to greed. And it's the latter kind of attitude that we're going to see first, the worldly view of wealth. Two main points today. Number one, the worldly view of wealth. Now, James has some pretty serious things to say about this world's view of wealth. Of course, the, the world's view of wealth is the predominant view in our society today. 
It is the wealthy who tend to look smart and sophisticated, earning the big money, driving the nice cars, wearing the designer clothes, frequenting the exclusive venues. It's the wealthy who always seem to have the power and influence who move in the right circles. But James James cuts through all of that external glamour and razzmatazz of it uh, to help us to see the way God sees all of this. And do remember, it's not wealth, it's not money, it's not riches themselves that are the problem, but worldly attitudes towards these things. James shows in verse 3 how the worldly view is to hoard wealth for yourself. You have Hoarded wealth in the last days, he says. That, that's, that's doubly bad, actually, to hoard wealth and to do it in the last days. The last days. Now, you remember the last days, biblically speaking, is simply the time period between the two comings of Christ, between his incarnation and between his return in power and glory at the end of the world. That is the time period that we are supposed to use to prepare ourselves for the coming of Christ. We are supposed to regard that return as imminent and consequently use the time that we have to prepare ourselves to meet our Maker. And it must be said that hoarding wealth for yourself is not going to stand you in good good stead when that day comes. And this brings us quickly to the searching question of whether you own your wealth or whether your wealth owns you. And I suspect that the more you have, the more searching that question becomes. And so there's a pattern. The more you earn, the more you have, the more you have, the more you want, the more you get, the less it satisfies, and and, and so it just keeps on going. John D. Rockefeller, U.S. oil magnate and philanthropist, one of the richest men in the world of his generation, was asked on one occasion about making money, how much is enough? He answered wryly, just a little bit more. And contemporary to Rockefeller in New York was the Wendell family, five sisters and a brother who, despite receiving a huge family inheritance, spent very little of it and did all that they could to hoard their wealth. And when the last sister died in 1931, there was no next generation to hand anything on to in their family. And when the last one died in 1931, her estate in 1931 was valued at more than $100 million, and her only dress was one that she had made herself and that she had worn for 25 years. The point is that wealth can instill a real spirit of miserliness and and selfishness. It doesn't have to, but it very often does. And despite a world of need, the wealthy can often feel quite comfortable to hoard their wealth to themselves. Add to that, in verse 4, the fact that James has in mind uh, those who exploit others in their hunger to get more for themselves. So, the, the, verse 4 is about exploiting others to get more. And the, the, the issue is that these rich people, they haven't paid their workmen fairly. They hire these poor men to work from them. They exact a day's labor uh, from them, and then they refuse to hand over a fair wage. Now, in those days, such workers as that lived in extreme poverty. It was a day-to-day, hand-to-mouth existence. Workers were paid at the end of each day for their labor. And so, to fail to pay was not just unjust. It was in a very real way to endanger the, 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 the liveliness, the, the, the very life and health of that worker and his family. But there is a, a long and tragic history of the poor being exploited by the rich, and that, of course, is a story that continues even to this day. doesn't have to be that way, but it very often is. Wealthy people who'd rather be a little bit wealthier than act justly and with integrity. Furthermore, verse 5 The worldly rich like to indulge their every pleasure. James says, you have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. 
And the, the New American Standard Bible has that, you have led a life of wanton pleasure. And the language indicates there that, that a line has been crossed in this matter. Now, now, luxury and pleasure, like money and wealth, are neutral things. That, but, but there is a sensuous way of taking these things, of perverting God's good gifts, of taking these things in the wrong way, with the wrong motive, at the wrong time, with the wrong person. And wealth can open up new possibilities of experimenting with such self-indulgence, indulging oneself and one's own fantasies and desires, while outside the poor are cold and hungry. And this is a kind of lifestyle that is glamorized and idealized in popular culture today, the, the pleasure-seeking, self-indulgent lifestyle. It doesn't have to be that way, but very often it seems to be. And then the fourth aspect of worldly wealth that James highlights, and this is in verse 6, is that the wealthy very easily trample anyone who gets in their way. James says, you have condemned and murdered innocent men who were not opposing you. Condemned and murdered, strong language, serious issues. Condemned suggests cruelly perverting justice, perhaps because you can afford to buy the verdict in a proceeding. Murdered takes it even further. The list is not short of those who have murdered others. Uh, because of uh, greed, uh, although it could also be taken to be a reference to the abuse of the poor by not paying them their fair wages, which, which could be seen as being tantamount to murder. Again, it doesn't have to be this way, but there are those who, if their wealth is threatened, would resort to pretty well anything to defend it or get it back, because their wealth means more to them than any one or anything, and there is nothing that they wouldn't do to preserve it. So, to summarize the picture that James paints here, the worldly approach to wealth is to get it, to keep it, to enjoy it, and to flaunt it, and to walk all over anyone who gets in your way. Now, now Gordon Gecko from Wall Street, uh, the trader in the film, he would endorse all of that enthusiastically. But from what James writes here, it is also possible to see a, a different way, a better way. And that is the godly view of wealth. So we're into number two now, the godly view of wealth. Wealth can be a barrier, a hindrance to real spiritual life, but it doesn't have to be. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. The, the, the case of the, the rich young ruler, the rich young man who came to Jesus illustrates uh, the point here. You remember that this, this young man came to Jesus to ask about eternal life. It was a good question, an important question to bring to him. But when Jesus, knowing his heart, went straight to the big issue of his life, go and sell your possessions and give everything to the poor, Matthew tells us, he went away sad, for he had great wealth. Now, the problem was not actually his wealth. Uh, that, that, that incident is not teaching us that nobody can be rich and be a Christian. It's not teaching us that all Christians must sell all they have and give to the poor, hardly. The problem was not his wealth. The problem was his unhealthy attachment to it. The problem was not being rich. The problem was idolatry. The problem was that his money was his God. And immediately after this encounter, Jesus goes on to say, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's easier, in fact, for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Again, it's not because wealth is wrong or ungodly, but because it has a habit of blinding the wealthy to important spiritual realities. A godly view of wealth is therefore very, very important. It enables us to view material wealth as being limited and transient. That's verses 2 to 3a. Uh, a godly view of wealth enables us to see material wealth as limited and transient. Limited because there are things it just cannot do. You know, money, money can buy a house but not a home. 
Money can buy you a bed but not sleep. It can buy you a book but not knowledge. It can buy you a clock but not time. It can buy you medicine but not health. It can buy you insurance but not safety. So money has its limitations. And it's not only limited, it's transient. It's short term. No pockets in a shroud. Remember, you can't take it with you when you go. Did you hear the story of the wealthy man who died and his passing was noted by many? And at the funeral, one former acquaintance asked another, how much did he leave in the end? And his friend's wise response was, he left it all. (laughs) He left everything. And that's the truth, isn't it? So much of our time and energy is spent acquiring things that are temporary, here today and gone tomorrow, useful for a time and then obsolete. And much of that is no doubt necessary and legitimate, but what a time and effort we nevertheless spend on things that are slipping through uh, our fingers. And the godly view of wealth recognizes this. So, verse 2 mentions wealth that rots. Now, our assets mostly do depreciate over time. That lovely car that you bought from new Depreciation takes over from the showroom onwards, doesn't it, as you go? That state-of-the-art computer that you bought five years ago, obsolete now, uneconomic to repair, just buy a new one. Verse 2 also has moths eating clothes. You know, in the ancient world, uh, your, your clothes were a real sign of your, your wealth or poverty, uh, and uh, probably that's, that's the same today. You go to the wardrobe and you find that your favorite, most comfortable, most expensive suit has got a hole in it that you hadn't noticed before. Or your Oxford Street shirts are stained and can't be cleaned. In, in, in verse 3, gold and silver are corroding. Now, gold and silver are, are generally pretty uh, durable uh, things, but, but if, well, let's put it this way. If you have money in the bank right now, then you will know that it is worth less and less. Your gold and silver is worth less every year right now because the interest rates are so low. So, the point is that we need to recognize the limitations and the transience of material wealth. If all of our hope is in that then sooner or later, we will find ourselves disillusioned. And the thing is, the situation is actually worse than we've just said. Because not only does material wealth diminish itself, but as we see in verse 3b, it can damage its owner as well. It can damage you as well. So, wealth itself inevitably diminishes And very often, wealth diminishes its owner. It's the love of money that turns people into hoarders and exploiters. It's the love of money that instills selfishness and greed and self-indulgence. It's the love of money that blinds people in different ways, blinds them to their own actions, blinds them to the needs of others, and perhaps most importantly of all, blinds them to spiritual realities. As uh, A.W. Tozer once said, the streets of gold do not have too great an appeal for those who find it so easy to pile up gold and silver here on earth. And there's truth in that, isn't there? Those, those who, who learn that they are able to solve everything with a checkbook have precious little sense of their poverty before God. Those who can buy anything that they want have precious little uh, sense of their need of God's undeserved grace. And if material wealth has that effect on you, if it blinds you to these ultimate spiritual realities, then it really does damage you. The thing is, the thing that we must underline and understand and proclaim is this, that true wealth is, above all, spiritual. This is what the believer must grasp. It's not that believers must be materially poor. It's not that luxuries in and of themselves are sinful. Indeed, many are blessings given by God to be received with thankfulness and enjoyed appropriately. But the believer, the Christian, 
having tasted of the spiritual blessings that are ours in Christ, that person can never again have the same appetite for mere earthly treasure, surely. Because we've learned to say with Paul that I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ as my Savior and Lord. You know, I mentioned John D. Rockefeller earlier on, and he is estimated to have been worth $900 million when he died in 1937. $900 million. And, and of course, he built that old, uh, that old skyscraper in New York City. Uh, not just the skyscraper, but the whole area uh, around it, the Rockefeller Center, that all still bears his name. He was an extremely wealthy man, but this is what he once said. The poorest man I know is the man who has nothing but money. Now, now, people might say, well, that's all very easily, easy for you to say, Rockefeller. You had plenty of it. But, but, but that's the power of the statement. The poorest man I know is the man who has nothing but money. What then can we say about true wealth? Well, first, we can say this. It stores up treasure in heaven and not on earth. That's what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount. Don't store up treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up treasures in heaven where, where all of that doesn't happen. For where your treasure is, Jesus says, there your heart will be also. And the bit in the end there is the key. Where is your heart? Is it in the vault of a bank somewhere? Or is it in heaven? Is your wealth measured in pounds, dollars, euros, or, or some other currency that you'll be leaving to others whom you may or may not like uh, when you depart this earthly life? Or is it in the heavenly currency that is never devalued, that never diminishes, and that can never be lost or stolen? There is a place for material wealth. God blesses us in different ways according to His own divine wisdom and purpose. His gifts are given to be received with thanks and enjoyed. And believers who are blessed with wealth can do, can do a great deal of good with it if they have kingdom vision and are prepared to invest in eternity rather than in mere bonds and stocks and shares. But in the end, true wealth is spiritual and is heavenly, and the richest people on earth are those with deposits there. Furthermore, and as opposed to the worldly view of wealth, true wealth shares and doesn't hoard. The heart that has been truly redeemed by Christ has been given much, and so therefore that heart learns to give generously. And there's plenty in this letter so far on this subject. In chapter 1, there was the responsibility towards widows and orphans to look after them in their distress. In chapter 2, you remember the poor man who came into the meeting, and the, the instruction was not to, uh, the, not to prejudice him, uh, not to act against him, not to neglect him because he didn't seem as poor or important, uh, didn't seem as rich or important as, as others who were there. Uh, don't show partiality on the basis of wealth or poverty. In chapter 3, James included as the characteristic of, of wisdom from above, he included consideration, submission, and mercy. And such qualities cannot permit or tolerate hoarding or greed. And in chapter 4, James reminded us that God is sovereign, that whatever we do have comes from Him. And so it is ungodly to become hoarders with that which God has given us. But the soul blessed by God will not be content to look away or to cross over to the other side. It will seek to be generous. It will seek to bless others uh, and not just self. The Methodist W.E. Sangster uh, made this comment concerning money. Money as money is not evil. It speeds on errands of mercy and lends itself to a thousand philanthropies. It feeds the hungry, clothes the naked, and succors men who are tempted to suicide. 
It is the insensate love of riches which is the perilous thing. That, that, that confirms what we're saying about the good that can be done if we are sharers and not hoarders of what we have been given. And, <coughs> and connected to all of that, true wealth deals generously and doesn't exploit others. The idea the very idea that you would exploit or manipulate others just to gain material wealth will, uh, or at any rate should be, anathema to God's people. The godly view of wealth will give a fair day's pay in return for a fair day's work. There's a point of application if you're an employer. And it recognizes that justice and fairness matter to God, who sees the payslips that we pay, and who sees the account ledgers that are maintained. As James makes very clear here, a day of reckoning is coming. A day of reckoning is coming for those who exploit and abuse the poor and the vulnerable. In verse 2, there is misery coming upon the oppressive rich. You know, what's the usual sound of wealth and riches? It is, uh, it is laughter, it is delight, it is joy, it is partying. But James says it's misery coming upon the oppressive rich. In verse 3, the corrosion of wealth is testifying against the rich. In verse 4, the cries of the workers have reached Almighty God. Those who trampled others in their pursuit of worldly wealth and seemed to get away with it, will discover that God saw it all. And their wealth will be no use to them in that day, on the last day. Because the favor that they were able to buy on earth, they will not be able to buy with God, the judge of all the earth. And what they will find in the vivid metaphor of verse 6 is that they have fattened themselves in the day of slaughter. And that is shown to be suicidal. They have, they have fattened themselves by, by self-indulgence and by overindulgence, but they didn't reckon with it being a day of slaughter. And on the day of slaughter, what is it that gets slaughtered? Well, it is that which has been fattened for the occasion. And so such greed and selfish indulgence is seen to be utterly suicidal. And the last thing about true wealth is that it is enjoyed with gratitude and not indulged with greed. God gives good gifts, as we have said, to be received with thanks and enjoyed. The message is not that wealth is bad. It's not that it is impossible to be wealthy and be a Christian. But uh, through this passage of Scripture, those who are rich purely in this worldly terms are warned about how poor they actually are in ultimate terms. Well, my title today has been How to Be Really Rich. And the answer is, is actually very simple. It is by recognizing that in Christ we really are rich, blessed by God in the heavenly realm with every spiritual blessing in Christ. These include being chosen by God, being adopted, being redeemed, being forgiven. Who could put a price on these blessings that God has poured into us through His Son? But not just blessed in the heavenly realm, undoubtedly blessed in the earthly realm as well with the, with the measure of material uh, prosperity that God gives. We are blessed in that way to blessed to be a blessing, not to hoard it to ourselves, not to exploit others, but to share uh, and to deal fairly uh, and generously with others, to invest in the kingdom of God, which is the only investment that you or I will ever make that will pay out everlasting dividends. May we not be slow to invest in that bank, in that kingdom of God. And may we rejoice in the goodness of God to us and in all that he has given to us. We truly are rich brothers and sisters. And so let's give thanks now to God uh, for that. Heavenly Father, we bless you and praise you and thank you for all that you do give to us in this material realm. And we 
we, we will need really in light of this message, Lord, to reevaluate um, how we view these things, uh, our bank balances, our investments, and all of these things. May it all be brought into submission to Christ's lordship in our lives uh, so that we will be glorifying and honoring to you, that we will not be hoarders, uh, that we'll, we will not be exploiters, but that we would be generous and we would understand ourselves to be blessed, to be a blessing to others and to pay forward out of the goodness uh, which we have received from your gracious hand. But Lord, uh, we, while we may be blessed in the material realm and while we do offer sincere thanks for that, uh, we, we want to thank you for all that you've given us in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. How rich we are. Forgive us, Lord, if we sometimes forget that. Forgive us, Lord, if we sometimes underplay the significance of these blessings, but to be ransomed and healed and restored and forgiven. Oh, Lord, what, what praise we should bring to you. What thanks we should offer for these inestimable blessings of the gospel. Uh, Lord, we, we could never pay back all that you have done for us, but we rejoice in your grace that we don't need to, that you don't want us to, that we may be forever in your debt, O oh God, as we surely are and as we will continue. And so as we close our service today, to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.